Have you heard the Lord speak to you this morning yet? I hope that you have. Has God spoken to you this week? And if so, how did God speak to you? I think most of us would say this morning that when, when God speaks to us, it's generally through this, his word. This is the most reliable, the most authoritative way that God speaks to his people today. But there are other ways that God speaks. And we'll talk about those in just a moment. Please open your Bibles to John, 1 John, excuse me, near the end of your New Testament, the letter of 1 John will be in the second chapter. We began a study of 1 John on Wednesday night in our Wednesday night prayer and Bible study time at 6 o'clock in Fellowship Hall. We'll be working our way through this letter both on Sunday mornings and, uh, excuse me, Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. So if you want to be a part of a Bible study, a verse-by-verse -verse study of a book of the Bible this, uh, this winter, we would encourage you to come and be a part of that study on Wednesday night and Sunday night. In fact, Sunday night this evening, we'll meet at 6 o'clock in, uh, in the choir suite to continue our study of 1 John. We're in the second chapter of 1 John. Let's stand and honor the reading of God's Word. The beloved apostle writes, Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. May God add his richest blessings to the reading of his word, and may his Holy Spirit apply the preaching and teaching of his word to our hearts and lives this day. Please be seated. How does God speak to you outside of directly reading his word or hearing his word preached? Well, he speaks to us in lots of ways. Yesterday morning, God had a little word for us when we woke up and saw the beautiful snow. God speaks to us through a sunset. Sometimes God speaks to us through a bumper sticker. I saw one the other day. It says, God loves you, and I'm trying. I thought that was a pretty good message from God. When I was in, in, in college, there was the bumper sticker, Honk if you love Jesus. And that was part of, that was in the days of the Jesus movement, the uh, early 1970s. And I would honk, and the person would forget that they had that bumper sticker, and they would shake their fist. And, you know, my favorite one was... Uh, a tithe, if you love Jesus, any goose can honk. I thought that was a, a pretty good word from the Lord. Sometimes God talks to us through a poem or a testimony in worship. Obviously, God speaks to us through music and through song, as he has this morning. But how many times has God spoken to us through circumstances, through the events of our lives, God spoke to Claudia and to me 37 years ago this week through a house fire. I was on a staff retreat. It was a Monday afternoon, the 4th of January, 1982. Claudia was at her first day back after Christmas break teaching at the alternative school in Waco. An emotionally disturbed child, a 13-year-old who loved Claudia as a teacher, had broken into our house and had started three fires and then ran down the street proclaiming the Alcorn's house is on fire, the Alcorn's house is on fire. That was this child's way of getting the attention that they craved. And when the fire chief arrived and saw this child, he said, I've seen that little boy at way too many fires. And the child wound up getting the help that that child needed. But it's amazing how at 2.45 in the afternoon, your life seems to be going just fine. And then by 3.15, Everything that you've accumulated in six years of marriage is either destroyed or, or burned so badly it takes months and months to restore. And for the next several weeks, your time is consumed by things. Things. You, you itemize things for the insurance company. You try to salvage things that, that meant so much to you. You air out things to try to get rid of that smoky smell. You, you flip through page after page of department store catalogs. Today we would go online and, 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 and scroll down page after page of the internet to find out how we can replace some of the things that we have lost. Claudia and I went through that experience. 
And I don't think either one of us would say, oh, it was such a tragedy. It was not a tragedy. For one thing, nobody got hurt. The fire didn't spread to anyone else's property. Even our dog lady, the collie, was, was okay. Our church responded in a remarkable way. So it wasn't a tragedy, but it was an inconvenience. It was a headache for several months. I think it could have been a tragedy of sorts if we had gone through it and learned nothing from it. Then it would, would not just be an inconvenience. It would have been a waste of time and a wasted experience. And I'm convinced that God never wastes time in the lives of his children. Now, God didn't cause that fire, but he can sure as fire use it to speak to us through that event. And he did, and I think we listened. And what Claudia and I learned through that experience was the title of the sermon this morning. Things have never been the same. For us, things, material things, have never been quite the same in our lives. For we learned through that experience what John wrote to these Christians at Ephesus 19 centuries ago, that the things of this world are not enduring. They have no lasting value. They are not eternal. They can belong to you one moment and the next moment they are gone forever. They're lost. And so for us, things have never been the same. John writes in 1 John 2, verse 15, Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. For if any person, any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. One of the most difficult challenges for the Christian is to live in this world without the world living in us. To remain in vital union with Christ and still live among the, the pressures of this world of things. It's not an easy task. So John says, don't love the world. Don't love the things that are in the world. Now, the word world, as John is using it here, is not the world of people. God's not telling us, don't love the world of people. That's the world that God loves so much, he gave his only son to die for our sins. God loves the world of people. Neither is it the world of sunsets and rivers and snow and flowers and beauty and stars. That's the world that God created. That's the world of nature. The psalmist says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God loves the world of creation and God loves the world of people. But the world from which John instructs us to withhold our love and our affection is that world system that is opposed to God. That world system that's opposed to everything that God stands for. The world system that is opposed to the kingdom of God. It's the lure of the world which competes against God for the affections of God. Of man's heart. C.H. Dodd, the great theologian, defines John's use of the word world here as human society that's organized on wrong principles, characterized by base desires, false values, and egotism. It is the world that has forsaken the God who made it. It is that philosophy of life which dominates so much of our thinking today. Get all that you can without giving accumulate and amass without sharing. Stay where you are and be comfortable while the rest of the world suffers hunger and deprivation. And the majority of Americans, in fact, I hate to say it, but the majority of Christians have adopted ourselves to that value system, that idea of success to the degree that we expend our energies pressing to acquire things. Filling our lives with things which are new and shiny and different. And yet we ourselves remain old and unchanged. Lloyd Ogilvy wrote, we gulp life and taste nothing. We eat life and have no savor. We try to fill with things and people and activity the emptiness that only God himself can fill. And this craving for things is that aspect of the world that John says we are not to love. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Seems like we never stand still long enough to really evaluate our relationship or our romance with the world. And that's really what I'd like for us to do this morning. I'd like for us to pause just long enough, be still long enough to evaluate the kind of love that we have for this world. And John says the way to do that is by taking an inventory of our dominant desires. He calls them lusts. 
but the word that's translated lust here can equally be translated desires in the Greek text. What are your dominant desires? What do you desire most in life? Could you write that out in 25 words or less? If I gave you a sheet of paper this morning and said, really, what, what are your ultimate loyalties? What are your ultimate desires in life? Could you, could you write them out? And I don't want you to write down what you think they ought to be or what you, you'd like for your dominant desires to be. I think all of us know what they ought to be, but what are they really? If you were to ask the people who are closest to you, the folks that live life with you, what, what, are my, what do you think are my ultimate loyalties and the dominant desires of my life? What would they say? If you ask the, the, the folks that run the stores where you spend your money, or if you ask the folks nearest you, your, your roommate or your spouse or your children, I thought about this week, if I were to call up Bill and Hogan and say, boys, you've known me for 34 years, 32 years, you, you've watched how I spend my life, how I spend our money, spend my time, what would you say are, are the, the, the real dominant desires of your dad's life? I, I started to feel a little bit uncomfortable, to be honest. I felt a little uneasy about that because I think all of us swing, we vacillate between our love for God and the wrong kind of dependent love for the things of the world. So how, how do we really inventory and evaluate those ultimate loyalties by which we live, those ultimate desires? Well, John gives us, in verse 16, three practical tests. He says, love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Those three areas we can test. Let's take the first one. The lust or the desire of the flesh. By that, John's describing the life that's dominated by the physical. It's, it's the life which says what's best for me is what feels good to my senses. It's that childish behavior in so many adults who want what we want when we want it, regardless of what it does to us or to those around us. And of course, this pleasure principle ultimately leads us to view people as things and as objects created for our own gratification, our own self-satisfaction. We make gods of our own comfort and our own ambition. We live for our comfort. That's the desire of the flesh. To live a life dominated by our senses. Is that where your ultimate loyalties are? Second test of our desires, John labels the lust of the eyes. Is your life controlled and obsessed by the things that you see? The lust of the eyes is the, the spirit which can see nothing without wanting it. For yourself. And once you have it, you flaunt it before others. It's American consumerism gone wild. It's the spirit of man which believes that happiness is found only in the things that money can buy and the eyes can see. Go back to bumper stickers. It's the one that says, the, the one with the most toys when he dies wins. It values only those things that have a price tag, only the material. Where does the lust of the eyes fit in in your evaluation of your dominant desires? And then the third one is the boastful pride of life. Quite simply, this is the desire in life to outmaneuver and outshine everybody else in order to make yourself look good. It's that self-centered lifestyle that is constantly seeking praise for yourself. William Barclay describes the man of this lifestyle as one who continually boasts about the things which he does not actually possess. And all his life is spent in an attempt to impress everyone he meets with his own non-existent importance. The old evangelist Billy Sunday used to say, The proud man is all front door. When you enter in, you're already in his backyard. There's no substance. Well, it's checkup time. 
Where do you stand in your relationship with the world? Is your life dominated by the desire for things, material things, physical things? And once you have them in your possession, is yours the attitude of the self-made man who says, I got these by my own good works. I did this myself. I've earned it all. And therefore, because I have so much, that makes me better than others. All that John is asking here is where do your ultimate loyalties lie? Are they with the world? Are they with the Lord Jesus? And the reasons it's so important is found in verse 17. John says, for the world is passing away. And also its lusts or its desires. But the one who does God's will lives forever. He who does the will of God abides forever. Forever. John's argument is this. The things of this world to which we often dedicate our lives, those things are temporary. And so are our desires temporary. Let me illustrate that. How many of you can remember your first bicycle? Would you just raise your hand? Can you remember what your first bicycle looked like? You re- Man, some of you, I didn't know they had bicycles you when you were a boy. Do you remember your first one? We remember our first bicycle. It was great. It was almost like when we got our driver's license. Remember that first car? My first bicycle was a hand-me-down from my cousin Billy Jack. He was five, five and a half years older than I. And when I got my bicycle, it was in the early 60s, and Billy Jack could get a driver's license in Brownwood at age 14 and a half. Some of you remember those days. So he's driving a car, but I get his bicycle. I was so excited. I don't know if it's a Swin or a Huffy or, or what kind of bicycle it was. It was just mine. And my uncle had, had repainted it red and white, and it, it had the little streamers coming out of the handles, those little plastic streamers that he put in it. It had big old wide tires so that you could drive it through, through dirt and mud. It was just the greatest. I can remember going up and down the streets in Brownwood and up and down the alleys, and we'd build ramps and we'd jump the bike. And it was a great, great day to get that bicycle. Where is your first bicycle today? You have any idea where it is? One or two of you may, but for most of us, our first bicycle that we thought we couldn't live without, we desired so much, it's probably rusting away in the bottom of some garbage dump or junk pile. Or it's been recycled and you drank a Dr. Pepper out of it this week, didn't even know it. (laughs) The same thing that happened to your first bicycle happens to your first car, your first television set. It happens to your first house. All things are temporal. All things are temporary. They don't last. It's the nature of them not to last. So so they are, as John says, passing away. They're not eternal, and therefore they are not worthy of our ultimate loyalties. That's very important that we don't misunderstand what John is actually saying here. He's not saying that Christians are forbidden to admire or to appreciate and use correctly the good things of this world. When I was in college, I pledged a fraternity, and I remember one of my Christian brothers in the dorm said, hey, Stan, you shouldn't do that. I said, why not? He said, because Jesus never pledged a fraternity. Well, he was right in that Jesus never pledged a fraternity, but I thought, you know, Jesus never wrote with a big pen either, and he never drove a Volkswagen Beetle like I drove. Does that make those things automatically wrong? No, of course not. There's nothing wrong with owning or using a microwave or a smartphone or a refrigerator or any of the inventions of the modern world that have elevated the the quality of life. God created us in his image. And part of that image is for us to be creative and to invent good things. And we as Christians are free to enjoy the useful, valuable things which God has allowed to be put around us. But we're not free to spend all of our time and all of our mental powers and physical energies thinking about and scheming about and dealing with and chasing after, grasping for, or clutching at the things that we have accumulated. We are not free to fall in love with the world. Dryander wrote, What I have to that my soul clings. What I love is what I live for and what I delight in, and this becomes part of my unconscious life, my meditation, and my dreaming. What I love becomes more and more a part of my very self. He who loves the world becomes worldly, a man filled with the world. 
The Bible says, do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. Why? Because the world is passing away. Alexander the Great understood this. He was the most powerful and the wealthiest of rulers, of monarchs of his day. And yet he commanded at the time of his death that when his body be viewed by his subjects, when they walk by and look at his lifeless body, that his arms not be crossed across his chest holding a scepter, but instead his hands and arms be stretched out, palms up and empty, so that all might understand you take none of this wealth or power with you to the next life. Somebody asked, how much did Howard Hughes leave behind? How many billions did he leave behind? I can tell you to the penny, he left it all behind. And so will you. And so will I. John says the world and its lust, they're passing away. But the one who does the will of God, what? Lives forever. He who does God's will abides forever. And what is the will of God? Jesus says point blank in John 6 verse 40. This is the will of my father. That everyone who beholds the son and believes in him may have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. God's will for you is to have eternal life. And that life is found in his son. In fact, John will write later on in this letter, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. God's will is for you and for me to place our trust completely in the one who died for our sin and rose from the grave and is alive today and can enter our hearts through faith. That's God's will for you and for me to become conformed to Christ having placed our faith and trust in him. And anything that hinders our primary relationship with God or cripples our growth toward Christ's likeness, that's an expression of the wrong kind of love for the world. When I was a sophomore in college, I was part of, a, of an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ International. It targets college students to share Christ and high school students to, to, to win them to faith in Christ and disciple them so that they themselves can become disciple makers. That sophomore year, a group of us one night drove from Waco to Hamilton, Texas, which is about a, an hour outside of Waco. You go through Gatesville and come down Highway 36. Hamilton's exactly 113 miles from my house here in Abilene. I know all the stops from here to Waco. It's 113 miles, but just an hour from Waco. We went to spent some time with a man named Tom Joseph. He's a businessman in Hamilton. Um, he uh, was also a banker, and he had a beautiful ranch. And we were out at Mr. Joseph's ranch, and, and we had a wonderful meal. We enjoyed fellowship together. And then he began to tell us what God had done and would, was doing in his life. And part of his testimony was, he said, because I'm a successful businessman, and because I'm financially successful, I get asked to speak all over Texas at Kiwanis clubs and Rotary clubs and Lions clubs and Chamber of Commerce meetings. And he says, I usually begin by saying something like this, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a successful businessman. I've made a lot of money and I found a way to take my money with me when I die, when I leave this world. He says, boy, that grabs people's attention because no matter how successful folks are, they know that death is the great equalizer, that we take nothing with us. And Mr. Joseph explained to us, what I say to them is, I personally support 15 to 20 missionaries with Campus Crusade for Christ all around the world. And these folks are sharing Christ, the good news of Jesus daily and leading others to personal faith in him. So I'm taking my money with me by investing it now in the people's lives who are going to be with me in eternity where I'll live forever. What are you investing your life in? What are your dominant desires and ultimate loyalties? Is your life dominated by the physical? By the, the things that you can see? Do you love the world and its temporal, temporal pleasures more than you love God and his will for your life? The Bible says to us this morning, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. 
For if any person loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, it's not from the Father, it's from the world. And the world is passing away. And also its desires, its lusts. But he who does the will of God lives forever. Jesus said it this way, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Or seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and I guarantee you things will never be the same. Let's pray together. Father, this passage of scripture alerts us to ways that we may have loved the world inordinately. In fact, maybe we've loved the world more than we've loved you. Reveal to us the relationships and situations where we have bought into the world's values and the world's priorities. Reveal to us those areas where we are in danger. And help us to turn our affections upon you and your kingdom and, and our place of responsibility in that kingdom. May we become men and women who love not the world, but the will of God in our lives supremely. This is our prayer and our word of praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church family, would you stand with me? We're going to sing a hymn of commitment this morning, just as I am. Last week, two families came to unite with us during a time of decision. Maybe you are here this morning. Maybe you're here by yourself. You're here with family, and you've been visiting churches in Abilene, but for some reason, God has led you to Pioneer Drive. And maybe he's speaking to your heart today, saying, this is where I want you to serve, to plant your life, to grow with this body of believers. Or maybe you'd come today and say, Pastor, you, you talked about God's will for everybody's life. I've never taken that first step. I've never acknowledged Jesus as my Savior. I've never even acknowledged my need for a Savior. But there's something inside of me this morning that's saying, you need Jesus. He can forgive you. He can make you new from the inside out. Set your life on that journey of becoming more and more the person that God first created you to be. It can start today with a simple acknowledgement of your sin, your need for the Savior, inviting Jesus to come into your life, to be your Savior, to be your King. Just say to him, I want to live my life for you from here on out. And you'll begin that great, in fact, life's greatest journey this morning. Or maybe you, you just need to come and kneel at the altar. Talk to the Lord about something that's on your heart. The altar is always open. However Christ is leading in your life today, if there's a decision to make public, I'll be here to receive you. Jeff will be here. More importantly, the Lord is waiting. You come as we sing together.